What is up, down? And sideways, you beautiful creatures of this beautiful planet. Eric and Mark here with you guys for a little bit of League Unlock as we head into series number two of The Return. And the Faker effect is maybe even stronger in the Unkillable Demon King second series back with the squad, even though there was a little bit of for fun that he and both T1 had. But you know what? That's all good signs. It is a very good sign for T1 because you better believe that during his absence, there was no sorts of fun happening on the rift, off the rift type of thing. So to see this type of attitude and atmosphere start to reemerge for T1, I think is a very positive sign, a good sign for someone like Faker on that individual level. And of course on T1 as we're looking at how the team performs in game one, pretty clean, pretty clean, pretty solid performance from the whole crew and what they were doing. Zay is creating big advantage advantages in that top side and even even with getting caught out and a little bit surprised by Willard interrupting the shuffle and flash to try and escape everybody collapsing in which again is going to be a theme in this one everyone trying to collapse in on Faker and get the kill he's even smiling as it goes down and that's how you know you're in trouble if Faker is smiling when he gets caught out or gets you know killed like that in a, in a little play you know that he's invested into the game not even just smiling, but visibly giggling and actually like moving outside of the camera frame. That is a rarity to even happen. And let's be honest, two, three weeks ago, no one on this team was even smiling, let alone laughing. So seeing the impact that the atmosphere has now, them laughing like this was peak T1 domination. So even if it wasn't domination against Live Sandbox, it's, it's, concerning for teams that are going to be matching up against them in playoffs now that you're seeing them happy and the other big change you see in this series t1's giving up kills guys are getting caught out people are dying but there's no gold lead really amassing for lift sandbox even in game two it took a long time for them to finally get an advantage and during this losing streak they were ballooning snowballing out of control losing getting absolutely wrecked that just hasn't happened in I know it's a small sample size since Faker has returned, but that's another huge change. It's, it goes along with what we talked about in the previous match, right? Faker's first return, we were looking at a situation where you win a fight and then you're able to turn it around and pick up three turrets and then move around to this and grab this objective. Things like that, that type of little just macro sense and kind of clear direction of what we're doing in these situations wasn't there at all. Baker steps in, we see that type of impact. It's even continued more so in this series. And on top of it, as we mentioned, that global taunt, everybody wanting to get in and kill Faker, his absence must have made people feel like, this is the guy. If we get him, everything crumbles around him without forgetting that, yeah, but he's in game now. He's still in that voice comp with the other four guys, giving them the clear instructions, the information they need to make the big plays, to make their skills count. Because as we see with Faker in the lineup, you see that skill, you see them build these advantages for themselves. And that is the T1 that we know to be up in that top echelon of teams. Yeah, it's just the pressure that is removed on the other four members when Faker's there, even if he's going one and seven on Tristana, having some two pixel wide Tristana rocket jumps forwards. You're bound to have one of those, and there's no tastier snack in the game than a Zareth standing still doing his ulti when you can flank as a Jax. <laughs> That's kind of the thing is that we're seeing here, and we've talked about it earlier in the week. Of course, the picks that are going to be rising up in the next couple of weeks through Gauntlet and towards Worlds. Zareth is one of those ones in the mid lane. The only thing that scares me still about Zareth is the type of options that we still have in the meta for Engage. There's so many options, so many champions that have that ability to move out of something, get away from CC, and dive into that backline, make sure you're getting onto that um, immobile Zareth as he's doing these skill shots, trying to get out those damage, trying to get those ultimate shots to land. I can sympathize a little bit with Faker in that type of situation. Certainly one that I think we're gonna have to keep track of that Zareth pick in the next couple. So Faker, the squad, they go 2-0 in his return uh, over the couple of series. Most importantly, it seems like they have some confidence and now have some momentum heading into playoffs where they're still going to have a huge road ahead of them as that fifth seed. Yes, they very much do. But these two series, Faker stepping back kind of confirms a lot of these things that we believed about the team when he would step in and what type of change would occur, what type of form we would see return to these other four members. If you're any of these other teams in that LCK playoff picture, 
you want to avoid this T1 team as much as possible because they will be picking up steam and looking to put it down in playoffs. And we, we talked about this change, and I think we both kind of thought it's not just going to be one series, everything's fixed, they look back to normal, but kind of was, which is absolutely insane. Well, it kind of falls in the exactly in the same type of thing where we didn't expect it all to just fall apart right away without Faker there. And of course, you don't expect it to all be fixed when he's right there. But it does happen to work out that way for T1. Of course, there's so many things to analyze and really talk about that type of situation. But at the end of the day, Faker's back, Faker's performing, Faker's happy, and that should be double thumbs up for the T1 fan. And again, remember, this is... Guangdong Freaks, and then Live Sandbox. It doesn't matter if they're going to match up against Hanwha or D+. That, that's multiple tiers above the level of opponent you're facing in playoffs. Yes, and that is certainly uh, the benefit, I think, and kind of one of the uh, priorities. And, of course, still looking at the health side of things and rest and all that is important for Faker and making sure that this injury is properly you know, rehabbed back into performance shape and then kept in that performance shape is going to be a big part of his routine but talking about those teams yes they are going to be that level up but this was the perfect week bring him back in easy games controlled bring back that level of comfort and motivation and belief in yourself for these t1 players before we get to that do or die playoffs type of situation where we are not you know ranking up in the notch of difficulty and at the very least you know they finished on the friday it's an early week finish for them to close out the regular season two three days difference isn't making a real impact on an injury like he has but hey does it hurt to have a little bit of extra rest heading into playoffs and losers bracket side now of the lcs we had dig versus tsm kicking things off and the lcs just like the lpl delivering silver scrapes I don't know if I'll call it a banger. I'll say game four was spicy. This is this is right where the series got real interesting for me. You had some crazy uh, back and forth TSM. This fight over the Elder Dragon that lasted like a full minute between these two squads. I'm going to say that this was an N.A. banger qualification. Yeah, different tier of its own. Yeah, yeah. You got to understand that maybe, you know, the, the qualifications for it are a little bit different, a little bit easier to slot in, but we still want to see that excitement, see that pushback, see that fight out of both of these squads. And we certainly got no shortage out of that one in this series, going that full distance, silver scrapes. This was what you wanted to see from both of these ones, proving that they care that this is the end of the year for the loser getting knocked out in this situation. And, you know, Felt like TSM had the momentum after that wacky game four finish. And then you head into that decisive game five. The early game's looking good. It's another Zareth pick for the now star mid laner of Insanity. And you got Wild Turtle turning back the clock, turning around 1v2s into a double kill. Oh my goodness. It's not enough. It's <sighs> not enough though, Turtle. Yeah, that is the one thing that I do want to mention because this is kind of one of those things as we see with Turtle, we've talked about him rising up and kind of beating expectations for people at this point in his career and what was going on this year. I think stepping into playoffs, we still also had that side of, yeah, well, he's been making a couple more mistakes, a couple more of those, oh no, Turtle type of moments that we know so much in his career. Didn't really see that in these playoffs. Saw him really being that leading forward, uh, you know, ADC for this TSM team, dish out that damage and turn around plays like this that 1v2 that we're talking about big time play not enough not enough for the tsm faith and you know you got you got rich playing leblanc top in this series jensen had some fantastic tristana performances credit to dig as they were able to turn around this game five the Zareth pick didn't have too much of an impact felt like he was always late or slow getting into a lot of these team fights and was never able to actually do any damage it was tough and especially it kind of comes along the lines excuse me, is what we were talking about with T1 and Faker's situation on Zareth. Look at the composition that you're going up against as this Zareth. You have the Rakan on the enemy team that's going to be diving in and getting on top of you. You got the Maokai that's going to dish out that long range route and he's going to be coming in to get that instant point and click CC and everything else. You add in the Gwen, you add, it's just not a situation that I think that that Zareth was ever going to be able to outside of maybe towards that mid game find the ability to have that space to dish out that damage and pop off it never existed for insanity no matter how far ahead psm found themselves in this game jensen i don't miss worlds 
Hasn't quite qualified for Worlds yet, but one small step closer to dig completing a miracle run and obviously something we're going to revisit as news comes in the offseason, but potentially the last game you will ever see of the Team Solo mid logo in the LCS. Well, all I got to say about that one is I've still not changed my stance or position about Reggie and TSM in this type of situation. Uh, let the door hit you on the way out type of thing. I think the legacy of the organization in the earlier times of the LCS is certainly something to look back on and cherish in some type of ways, the memories, the players, the accomplishments. Uh, and then when we're talking about here, the last bit of this one is TSM exits out this type of thing, whoever is buying this TSM spot, whoever's figuring out how to get this LCS spot, you better sign your boy Insanity to a starting lineup gig. I don't know how, if there's any takeaway from this, it's not that Insanity is deser deserving of that starting role on an LCS squad. And that's the one last checkmark positive you could say for TSM on the way out is to say, you promoted domestic NA talent and proved that there's talent in the academy system that are not only deserving of an LCS start, but that can thrive and star in that starting role. All it took was signing Ruby away from their team there. <laughs> and it took their very it. last split in the league to do it. Holy moly. Yes, this is it. And I think, you know, for a lot of TSM fans, I'm I'm sorry that it does turn out this type of way. And it's unfortunate, but there are there are silver linings in this type of cloud to look at in this type of situation. And especially just in this current iteration right now, I think as an LCS fan, I'm pretty happy to see someone like Jensen continue this type of journey. He looked very thrilled with the performance of, of Dignitas in that game five to make sure they're getting across that finish line and keeping that type of promise, Mr. I don't miss worlds alive. A lot of people are going to be rooting for Dig on that miracle run. We got... 100 Thieves and Team Liquid, the other losers bracket, other LCS playoffs going on, LPL Finals, and the marquee LCK matchup, Hanwha Dom Juan. Things are heating up. It's the end of the summer split now. Oh, baby, that is that juicy, juicy third place matchup in the LCK, aka the Avoid Faker Bowl. We cannot wait. <laughs> that to means see that one go down. That means playoffs is officially started. If that's what you're playing for, <laughs> stakes that high. So both those squads should be fully locked in. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beautiful people. As always, thank you for watching. We will catch you on that flippity flip.